Okay, hi everyone and welcome. I'm Adam Berezin from MS Dynamics World and thanks for joining us for another great session as part of FastPath online GRC series. Uh, today's event will focus on best practices for setting up native controls in Microsoft Dynamics Nav and will be presented by Kim Congleton from FastPath. Uh, we're very happy to have Kim here with us today. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention that you could submit any questions you have during the session through the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, and Kim will try to get to all of them at the end of the event. So without further delay, um, I'm going to pass it over to our presenter, Kim Congleton. Uh, thanks, Adam, and uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, let's go ahead and start with just kind of finding out a little bit about uh, everybody who's on. Just want to do a couple of quick polls. Um, we want to see uh, what version of Microsoft Dynamics NAV everyone's running and uh, just kind of find out what your role is so we can kind of uh, make sure I hit some certain areas when we talk about it. So um, while you guys are answering that poll, I'll just go ahead and uh, do a little introduction about me. So I have been in the um, working with Dynamics NAV for the last 12 years. Um, I've done that in a number of different roles. Um, I've been an analyst, uh, consultant, implementer, um, solution architect, developer, uh, director of IT. So I've kind of uh, been with the product and, and done a number of implementations, upgrades, re-implementations. So uh, security and native controls are always things that I've had to work with. So this should be a uh, fun session hopefully today for you. Uh, I've been a speaker at Summit and Convergence, um, so I've presented at Summit and Convergence. Um, I've also been a NAVUG board member, and I'm on the programming committee for NAVUG. And so let's just take a look at our agenda here. So what we're going to go through today, we already went through the introductions. We're going to look at the security model inside of NAV. Uh, we're going to talk about security reporting, uh, administrative access, uh, segregation of duties, audit trails, um, and workflow. And, and as we talk about all of these things, what we want to keep in mind is, is that we really want to kind of um, help you be compliant in NAV and kind of go through what native controls exist and how to use them. And then the areas where there are no native controls, um, want to give you some tips and tricks on how to help with that. So the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the security model. So when we talk about the security model inside of Dynamics NAV, um, the user is really the root of everything. That's where it starts. You know, segregation of duties is going to start with the user reporting, being compliant. All of those things are going to start with the user. So at the user level, you're going to assign permission sets. And permission sets um, are going to be a set of objects, uh, securable, securable objects, uh, that you can grant access to. So it starts with the user, you assign them permission sets, and then inside each permission, permission set is going to be a permission that people uh, can get granted. So you can grant access to um, a lot of different things inside of NAV. You're going to be able to grant users access, uh, read access, insert, modify, delete, on table data, um, we'll talk a little bit about indirect permissions um, a little bit later. Indirect permissions could almost be uh, a session all on itself because uh, it kind of gets a little bit confusing when you talk about permissions and indirect permissions. And then, um, you know, all the other objects that are securable inside a permission set, you're going to have execute on those objects. So, for example, like reports and code units, um, either a person can execute those or they can't. So that's the level of permission you can set with the, all of those other um, objects. And I have a, a, a visual slide that will show that a little bit uh, better later when we get, get down a couple slides here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that also comes with the standard NAV permission sets is a basic permission set. So what that is, is that's going to grant you um, all objects except table data, systems, uh, tables, and the change log. So it's kind of just the base things that people would need to access NAV. It will give you a good starting place. And then one of the things that uh, you also want to talk about is that you can grant access per company. So 
Um, when you go in, if you have multiple companies, I actually worked at a company where in one of the databases we had 25 companies. Um, not everybody should have access to all those companies. So you really want to make sure when you're looking at your at your permissions inside of NAV and granting those to people that you are paying attention to um, whether you're granting somebody access to all companies or really limiting that to just the company they need to. Then we'll look at also just kind of the different there's different user credential types inside of, of NAV. So there's the Windows authentication, there's NAV authentication, um, there's window groups, Windows groups, and then user groups as well. So uh, we'll take a look at those as well. And then when you look at those um, and when you design your security, you'll want to take a hard look at what's the type of credential you'll want to use. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, the other thing that I want to kind of talk about when you're looking at permissions and looking at the security model, the best time to probably take a look at this is either when you're implementing or when you're upgrading. It's a really good time for you to actually factor in redoing security or actually doing security properly. Um, it's always a challenge in an implementation or an upgrade or re-implementation to find the time to do permissions. Um, I know because I've, I've been in that world and it's happened to me before where, you know, you've run out of time and you just kind of have to slam things in and you don't really get to look at the permissions. But it's one of the things that you really want to build into your timeline. So, you know, it, it's critical uh, to really review on a regular basis who has access to objects in your database and what they can do with that access. So just make sure you build that into uh, the timeline when you're doing those types of projects. And, you know, don't forget, if you have new objects or new employees and new processes, always go back and kind of review those, um, you know, the permissions that you need to grant to people for access to those as well. So just going to kind of take a look visually at a couple of the security models. Um, so when we look at the security model for um, 2013 to 2015, uh, what you're going to see is that there's the different credential types that we have here, the user or the Windows authentication, uh, the NAV authentication, the ACS authentication. You have the Windows groups. Um, so if you wanted to use Active Directory Windows Groups, uh, the user has to exist in NAV um, before, you can, before it will inherit the permission, but you could use Windows Groups as well. Um, and all of those things are going to then filter down to a permission set. So again, it kind of starts with the user or the group, um, and then you're going to assign permission sets to those users or groups. And then the securable objects that the permission sets are going to grant access to um, you'll see those all lined out down here. So table data, so for example, if somebody is able to read or insert or modify or delete a vendor, uh, the data in a vendor table, this is where you're granting them that access. Um, then the actual table itself, uh, the reports, the code units, the XML ports, uh, the menu suites, the pages, the queries, the system, any system tables or um, things like permissions, those types of things. All of these other objects, you're you're going to get. You're only going to be able to execute those or not execute those. Okay. And then with 2016, the model changed a little bit, and uh, where it changed was there's actually, excuse me, there's actually user groups inside of NAV now, and so what that means is that inside of NAV, um, you can. Uh, create user groups. So, for example, if I have an accounting department and I have, say, five AP clerks, um, and I want to basically those five AP clerks, 80% of their role is the same. 80% um, of the things that they need access to are going to be the same. So, what you could do is instead of assigning, um, you know, a permission set to, uh, you know, five different users and building out permissions for five different users, you can build out a user group called AP Clerk, or however you would want to name it, um, give those 80% those of the things that they need access to, and then when you start setting up the users, you, assign, you start by assigning that group, and then you can assign any additional permissions after that. And that really will kind of help you maintain and make it easier to really uh, look at the security that users are assigned. Now, 
we'll talk a little bit later about designing security, but one of the things you would keep in mind with that is if I only have, you know, uh, maybe two users in a group, do I really want to create a group? So it's really weighing the, the what's the return on investment, what's going to be more efficient for my, my uh, group. And then you'll kind of notice it has the same, um, you know, it has the same securable objects down here. Uh, all of that is the same, really the user group with, with uh, 2016 and 2017, that was the new addition. So when I talk about designing security, um, it's kind of like um, when you build a house. So when you build a house, um, you don't design and build at the same time. You know, you don't want the architect trying to design something at the same time that builders are building things because you could really end up with a mess. I mean, you could end up with 10 bedrooms and no bathrooms um, just because people were getting ahead of each other. So security is kind of the same way. It's one of those things that you really want to sit down and look at um, before you actually start building it out. Uh, you know, with 2013 and below, um, or 2015 and below, it really was challenging to set up security inside of NAV. If you had uh, a new role that you wanted to create um, and give permissions to something, it really was a trial and error basis. You know, you're granting them what you think they need, then you have them try it, then they get an error, then you fight through that next error, see what they need permissions to next, and then you kind of go back and forth, back and forth, and it can be really time consuming. So in a lot of ways, people sometimes were like, you know what, I'm just going to use the roles out of the box. However, when you use the roles out of the box, it really, um, it really in some cases may grant people more access than they need based on the job that they're doing. So it's really critical to go through, sit down, and pick a tool um, that you want to use, whether it's Excel or something else. I have an example of uh, an Excel tool that that uh, somebody used for GP, um, but it could be easily adapted to NAV. Uh, so we'll show that in a minute. But So what you want to do is really go through, identify the roles and groups in your organization, identify, you know, what's the process that each role or group needs to be able to execute. So, you know, uh, go through your accounting department, go through your sales department, go through your customer service department, really figure out what are the roles in each of those areas, and then identify what each of those groups needs access to and what do they need to be able to execute. And then really make sure that that's a partnership between IT and finance or any business owners that it needs to be. Um, you know, I came from an IT background and, you know, a lot of times IT does get tasked with setting up permissions, but you really have to make sure that it is a partnership between IT and the business so that um, you know, when it does come time, if you are being audited, uh, that the business managers, since they have to review those, that they know exactly what's being granted to each of their people as well. So really review that with the managers, review each role or group. And one of the things you always want to remember when you're designing security, less is more. So you really want to limit um, permissions down to truly what people need. And it's not... It's not because, you know, everybody is out there to try and do something bad with their permissions. It's really also to kind of protect the users as well. You know, if, if you uh, set everybody to super, you know, somebody could click on something and just really not realize that they had access to that and do something they had no idea they were doing. So it's really critical to limit their permissions to the least, um, just what, the bare minimum that they need access to. And then just kind of a couple of screenshots here just so you'd have them in the uh, in the deck, but we'll also go through and look at um, the actual uh, program. We'll log into NAV here in a second and just kind of go through some screens and go through the actual permissions recorder in 2016. Um, that's a really, really neat feature that will help um, when you actually go to do security uh, inside of NAV. Uh, so just kind of looking at permission setups here, uh, you can see there's a list of objects or table data that somebody would would uh, be able to grant access to. Um, you'll see the different, you know, read, insert, modify, delete permissions. So you see the different uh, different permissions execute uh, all of those things there. 
um, just talk a little bit about the basic role. Again, that's kind of a, one of the roles that comes out of the box with NAV. Um, and it's one you can use to kind of uh, limit or, or have a basis for some of the things that people have access to. So you can see these are the things that it's going to grant access to inside of NAV. And again, this kind of is that basis one, um, but it's something you want to look at too on whether it makes sense to grant this to people. And then just a little bit about indirect permissions. I'm not going to go too in-depth here because, um, like I said, it could almost probably be another session all on its own sometimes. But um, for indirect permissions, it's kind of the way we look at it is that it's half a yes permission. So um, if you grant somebody an indirect permission, they're going to need uh, to get the rest of the permission from some other other um, access to some other object. So, for example, if you are trying to post a sales order, um, the sales order post function is going to include a delete of the sales line record. So if you, might be a little hard to see here, but you can see here that there's access to the sales line and the access that's granted is uh, a read uh, an indirect permission to an insert, and an indirect permission to a delete. So this role here, uh, this uh, sales and receivables role here, is going to grant half a permission for somebody to delete a sales line. And then combined with uh, the permission from on code unit uh, 80, where you get the uh, insert and delete uh, permissions, you're going to get a successful post. But if you change that access to code unit 80 um, and say that there is no insert or delete permission, then you're going to get an error posting. So again, it's that combination of the access to the sales line and then a combination of code unit 80, which actually posts the sales line, that gives you that full permission um, to, allow you to, to allow you to actually post that document. And then one of the things that, that is, is really critical when we're talking about compliance and we're talking about, um, you know, doing segregation of duties properly um, is reporting. And so inside of NAV, there's really no uh, standard security reporting um, when you are setting up permissions. There's no uh, reports that, that you can look at that say, I have these users that have access to these roles. You know, that's really one of the first things that auditors want to look at, is who has access to your system and what access uh, do they have. So uh, you can kind of see it on the screens themselves, but a lot of times what happens is that uh, users end up creating, you know, manual reports, whether it's, uh, you know, you've kind of used some set of filters inside of, of the change log or inside of permissions, um, or if you actually create some some uh, uh, reports inside either inside of NAV or as an SSRS reports, it kind of just depends on what makes sense for your uh, company. You know, I kind of uh, the company that I came from um, to get through our audits, it was kind of a combination of you know SQL database queries, um, filtered views inside of the database. Uh, SSRS reports, it was kind of a combination of all those things to actually pull all that information out when I was doing it without a third party uh, product. So it kind of makes, it, it kind of is up to you as to what makes sense and what tools um, you have available to you in your organization to, to work with that. So um, kind of look at what are the things that my auditors are looking for what are the different things that they want to see, and then what makes sense, what's the right tool to do that with. You know, it's really something, especially with reports, you want to make sure that somebody is actually reviewing them on a regular basis as well. So once you've decided on the tool and once you've created that process, you want to make sure that you have a really good process in place that's going to allow for um, people to review those reports as well. And then when you're talking about reports, make sure you're identifying who is the person that's going to own it. So is it a manager in uh, you know, a certain area? Is it a business process owner? Make sure 
um, if it's not related to IT, that it's not IT that's doing that. So, for example, if in the accounting department the CFO needs to review who has access to vendors on a regular basis, because um, that's always one of the things that auditors will look at is who has access to vendor, create a vendor, edit a vendor, those types of things, you know, make sure that you've identified the proper person inside of accounting to review who has that access, whether it's the CFO, accounting manager, director of accounting, um, whoever that is, make sure that that is, is identified and then put in place what's the process for how often that should be done. You know, is it done on a quarterly basis? Is it done on a weekly basis? Is it done on a monthly basis? I mean, you don't want it to get crazy where you can't get your other job done, but you do want to make sure that if you've created the reports and the data is being generated, that somebody is actually looking at it. Because if you're not looking at it, um, you know, you're not going to catch things that, that you may need to down the road. So, you know, it's always good to identify what are the things we should review? What are the things that um, are, you know, what are what are your highest risk areas, high risk areas that you need to look at? So when you're looking at permissions, what are the areas that you want to review um, based on uh, the level of risk? So for example, you, you always want to review who has super access. So um, if, you know, somebody in IT has super access, you want to make sure that there's somebody uh, in the IT department also reviewing that as well. Um, and then make sure that you capture a sign-off. You know, auditors are always looking for the evidence to support you um, that you're following the process and that that process has been completed. So um, if you do quarterly reviews, make sure there's documentation of the review and the sign-off um, so that you can provide that to the auditors. And then, like we kind of talked about before, there is the administrative access. So, you know, one of the common pitfalls that, that um, I've seen some companies fall into is, you know, you kind of get through the initial implementation, you get through the upgrade, and you run out of time for permissions, and so people are getting errors, and a lot of times, uh, sometimes we re resort to just assigning somebody super um, because that will give them access to everything, their errors will go away, and they'll be able to continue working. What happens if you don't go back and fix that is kind of like I talked about before, people who have super access and don't really know what that means can kind of click around and do some bad things that they, they you know, didn't intend to do and didn't do intentionally but because they had all that access and they clicked on things and just kind of um, were feeling their way through the system, it might result in something very bad happening. So, um, you know, out of the box, it, it is, NAB is going to come with two uh, super roles. You're going to get super and super data. Uh, super is going to grant you access to everything. Super data is going to grant you um, access to almost everything. Um, and then, uh, so you have those two roles out of the box. The first user that you create in, in NAV is going to be assigned super. But then after that, you want to make sure um, you really monitor who has that, that access. You know, really in a live environment, it's kind of, um, it, you know, I, I've, I've heard arguments for and against having, um, you know, multiple people have access to a live environment as the super role. Um, it, it's really something you want to weigh carefully. Uh, and it's not only to protect the company, it's also, to, like I said before, it's to protect that user that has that access as well. So just make sure you have a really good process in place for reviewing that on a regular basis and make sure that you're really uh, being conscious of who you assign that role to. Um, if you have people who are tasked with um, you know, troubleshooting uh, your database, if you have a developer on staff, those types of things. Make sure that you really have a good process in place, uh, whether it's, um, you know, somebody else is reviewing their code or somebody else is deploying their code. Uh, it really gets uh, kind of tricky when you have that access that's really an all access. And then just kind of looking here again, um, you can see this is how the super role looks and the permissions that are granted to it. 
And so, again, it's really all, it's going to give you access to every single uh, object inside the system, and it's going to grant you full access. And then super data is just going to grant you that access, uh, that full access to table data. It's not going to grant you uh, the access, if you look back here, it's not going to grant you the access to all of the other system tables, queries, pages, all of those things. So you can see the difference between the two. And then read, uh, same again, you can see it's uh, access to all the ta table data, um, and it's just read only. And so let's uh, take a jump over into uh, NAV real quick. And let's get the screen share going. And one of the first things I want to look at is this is the tool I kind of talked about um, before when I was talking about designing security. So uh, one of the things you want to do is really try and create some roles that are smaller than the ones that come out of the box. So something that will help, again, is sitting down, uh, lining out what's my, what are the different roles I have, what are the different things that they need to be able to do inside of the system, and then really going through and then comparing that to the roles that come out of the box. Um, it, it's really hard for people to review the roles that are out of the box inside of NAV. So if we look at the permission sets here, um, some of them are easier to read than others, but for somebody that's not in IT, it can get a little confusing um, when you get down to something down here for like access to the purchase and sales uh, information. So uh, one of the things that we like to have people do, again, is create smaller permission sets uh, that make sense, more sense for what people actually need to do. And then make sure when you name them or um, when you give them the, the code and then also the description, that you're naming it or describing it in a way that makes it easier for people to kind of review those. Um, because it should be uh, people in the actual business reviewing those, not just people in IT reviewing those. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at how to create a smaller role. And we're going to take a look at doing that using the uh, the permissions recorder that uh, came with 2016 and then with actually with 2017 there's some pretty good improvements to it as well. So I'm just going to go into my permission sets here. I'm going to create a new one and you can see I've done quite a few already but I'm just going to say create customer and I'm going to say two because I already have one. So create and edit customer. We'll just say that. And so then the next thing I would do is actually go up here to permissions. And then if you go to actions, um, what it's going to allow me to do is actually turn on the recorder here and turn on this add read permissions to related tables. And I'm going to go ahead and say start. And uh, I've this is the first time I've actually done this. If you've done uh, one already inside of a database uh, recording, what it's going to say is that you may have some stuff in the cache. And then to clear the cache, you want to, uh, you'll need to kind of close and reopen the company before you do that. I, like I said, I don't have anything cached, so I can go ahead and say yes. And then what I'm going to do is go over here, and then you just go like you're actually setting up customer. So create a new customer here and there we go so many different and I'm going to do, just fill in what you need to fill in One of the things you want to do as well 
is if you want to make sure that they can also capture the ability to um, edit the customer, I need to just go edit a field here. And so that will capture the, the permissions required for editing the field as well. And when I checked on that add related read tables, this is what it's going to do. It's going to go out and capture that I need to go do, be able to do a lookup. I need access to be able to look at the country region code table as well. So any of those lookup things, um, it's going to capture that as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and go through here. Uh, make sure I don't have any other fields I need to add data into. Looks like I'm good. And I'm going to say OK. And so I added my customer. Then the next thing I do is go over to where I have this recorder running, and I can stop it. And it says, do I want to add them? And I say yes. And you'll see that it's added uh, my permissions there. Now, one of the things that you'll notice here, and one of the things that makes it easier using a recorder versus how we used to do permissions before, is that you might not always remember that I need access to like some add-on that I have installed, or even here, like knowing I need read access to this table or this table. I don't even know what those are, what we have turned on, but you know, for some reason I need access to this and this as well. This is the one I need to go look up. I have no idea what that one is, but. Um, you'll notice that it did give my insert and modify permission, my read permission to the customer table. It didn't grant me delete permission because I didn't actually delete it. Now, if I had went in after I set up the customer, after I modified it, and I deleted the customer, then it would actually capture this delete permission. So um, with the recorder, it does make it quite a bit easier to go in and really look at breaking your security down into much smaller roles so that it makes it easier to assign those and, and really know what you're granting access for people to in the system. OK. And so let's jump back over. And let's just talk a little bit about segregation of duties. So segregation of duties. Um, is always something that auditors will look at. Um, or even if you're not getting audited, it's really something critical that you want to keep in mind when you are setting up security inside of your, your, your system. Um, so segregation of duties, what it is, is making sure that if, for example, at a high level, if somebody can enter a vendor and somebody can create a purchase order, in theory, what they could do is create a fictitious vendor that could create a purchase order and get paid um, and pay themselves. So it's anything that kind of get, would give somebody the opportunity to financially harm your business. And one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that for a lot of companies, they're, they're not a size in which you actually would have a an accounting department where department where one person only one person is going to enter vendors and only one person is going to enter purchase orders. It's really not realistic in today's um, you know in in a lot of companies today. So what that means is you're going to have people that can do those things, but the thing that you need to do is be able to identify the people that have that access. And then have a process and control in place to mitigate, mitigate against that risk. So when you look at security, you want to try and figure out what's the methodology you want to follow. You know, we work with our um, customers to uh, really, we, we encourage anyone, whether they're a customer, our customer or not, but anybody who's looking at segregation of duties should really look at where is my high risk. Um, you know, it's just like kind of when you're looking at securing your home. Where's my high risk areas if I don't want my house to get broken into? I mean, the first and easiest thing I'm going to do is lock my doors and windows. I'm not going to really worry about somebody breaking out my skylight and repelling down from the roof. So, you know, that's probably not going to happen. So if you look at your company and you look at the different uh, roles and access that people have to your system, you need to kind of look at what are my high risk areas. And vendors and purchase orders are always a high risk area because it's one of the easiest ones to do. 
and it gets a little harder if you look at you know including you know a customer or uh, taking something, uh, going out back in the warehouse, taking something off the shelf and writing that off, those things have a little bit more visibility to them. So really what you want to do is sit down at your company and look at what those are. One of the places that you can look for information on that is um, the ISACA uh, 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 website. Um, that's an auditing website. Um, they'll have a lot of uh, tools and a lot of information there around segregation of duties rules. Um, it's one of the places that you know a lot of auditors and, and compliance people will look at uh, to really kind of see what they should be uh, analyzing in uh, different uh, areas. So look at you know look at their website, see what some of the rules are they're saying are, could create conflicts inside your system. And then one of the things you'll have to do is really figure out what's the solution you're going to build for that. You know, is it going to be a custom solution? Is it going to be automated? Is it going to be manual? Is it going to be, you know, an add-on? Things like that. Um, you'll just have to weigh what's what makes sense for your business. So one of the things too that you want to do is really look at then, you know, okay, so I'm I'm tracking the vendors. Uh, then how do I actually go about trying to see if something's happening? So you want to look at not only the vendor changes, but then, for example, you know, compare some vendor changes against some purchase orders. You know, do some manual transaction sampling. You know, you can build a, if you have the tools or the availability, you could have somebody build a SQL query for you where they're, they're pulling that information and put that into an SSRS report. Just kind of, you know, whatever makes sense for you. And then probably the most important point here is not to forget about process controls. That's really a critical area when you talk about segregation of duties. So it's not only what somebody can do with that access, but that you have something in place that's um, really putting some controls around things. So for example, if I have somebody that can create a vendor and create a purchase order, what is my control for making sure that nothing bad happens? Well, it may be that if that person enters, one person enters the new vendor, they block that vendor, it has to go to somebody else to verify all the setup information of that vendor and unblock it and say, yes, I approve this, it's ready for review. So then you're making sure that, you know, it, the, the vendor that was supposed to be getting set up got set up. It wasn't some weird address that looked weird. Um, and then you're saying, okay, two people have looked at it, we've confirmed, nothing bad happened, it's fine. Um, then maybe you also have a process in place where your, um, if a purchase order is over, uh, you know, $2,500 or $5,000, there's also an approval process for that. So it just kind of depends on what makes sense for you. But it's probably one of the most critical things um, that you can put in place that uh, will help you kind of identify some of those areas. And then you also want to make sure it really is going to be a balance of process and system controls. There's no one system that's going to do everything that you need it to do because, again, like I said, a lot of businesses are not going to be big enough where they can have two people do those things. So you're going to have to make sure that the things that you identify as high-risk areas, you have a balance of process controls and uh, system security to deal with that. And one of the things that, that auditors also look for is that not only are you tracking what people have access to, it's also what they actually do with that access. So inside of NAV, there is the uh, change log functionality that you can use. So um, you know you can turn on the change log, you can, you can specify the tables and fields to track, uh, you have to turn that on per company. Um, but there are some performance considerations that you're going to want to take into account. So, you know, for example, again, you kind of want to take a high-risk approach to what you turn on to track in the change log as well. You know, you don't want to turn every table on and every field in that table. Really make sure that you're looking at what's my high-risk area. So is it vendors? Do I need to track vendor changes? Do I need to track bank account changes? maybe GL account changes, those types of things, 
and then look at each of the fields inside those tables to make sure that you're not turning on more than you can look at or more that you're getting more than you need to you know for example do you really need to you know do many people use the fax number anymore um, do you really need to track that so those are things that you'll want to look at as you go through um, and deciding what are those things that you want to track because it will it will impact performance. We'll look at uh, my database in a minute here, and I think I have like 45,000 rows in it, and you will notice on a couple of things, there's a little bit of a delay when I'm doing some filtering, um, so you'll, you'll see that. But again, it really just kind of depends on the size of your data, uh, on the size of your database, how many transactions you're doing, and, and things like that. And then keep in mind, it is only going to track changes inside the Dynamics NAV database. So one of the critical pieces as well is that you do want to look at if somebody has access to your SQL Server environment, you want to make sure you have a process for tracking that as well. So, you know, changes, if somebody just goes into SQL and updates, you know, writes an update statement that updates a um, vendor, that's not going to be tracked. Or um, I heard of one example where a developer had actually um, added a trigger to a SQL table, a table inside of SQL, to capture the credit card number every time it was entered. So things like that, yeah, you, you need to have a, a separate process in place as well for reviewing your access at the SQL level as well. And then. Um, one of the things you want to keep in mind, too, is reporting on that audit trail data. So once you've identified what people are changing, you do have to make sure that you have a good process in place for reporting on that, on that data as well. And make sure, again, when it comes back to deciding what's the least amount of, of information I need to review, what's going to give me, um, you know, what's going to make sense for me to review, make sure that it's in a format that people can actually review and again, go through and make sure that you've identified who's the person that needs to own this and set up a process for, is it reviewed quarterly, weekly, daily, whatever. And then just kind of a couple of screenshots real quick um, on the changelog setup, how to set, turn it on. We'll go into the actual database and look at it. Again, just another uh, view of the changelog entries here. So we'll go over here real quick. And log back in here. And so again, how you turn on the change log, you just go into the change log setup, you click on the activate, um, you go to actions and table. And let me go to the top here. So you can see I've already turned on some. And uh, we'll just go ahead and turn on another one here. Just looking for a quick one that I haven't done. Um, where is... Just look at the bank account. Oops, can't type. Jail entry vendor. Uh, let's just take a look at jail account. That'll give us some. Uh, uh, we'll just go ahead and look at that. So if you the the main way you would turn one on is you just go in here and select. You want to do some fields, all fields. I would tell you never ever select all fields unless if it's a custom table that only has five fields in it. That's a different story. Um, but it should be very rare that you ever select um, all fields. So you would select some fields, and what I'm going to go in and look at is what um, I'm turning in that I want to log the insertion. So you have three choices when you look at the different tables. You can log the insert, the modifier, delete. Um, you know, a lot of times you're going to log all three uh, in most cases. So if you look here, you know, I've turned on name, I've turned on account type, I've turned on direct posting, uh, reconciliation count. So these are the things that, you know, just uh, 
were identified to be tracked. Now, if you wanted to add something, you could always add something. You can always go back after you're tracking things and you say, you know what, I think we need to track this one as well. You can always come back in here and change this if it makes sense for you. But again, I, I always recommend that people turn on less, look at the data that's getting generated, make sure you can review it, make sure it's not generating too much that you can't review, um, and then kind of go from there. So again, one of the things you'd have to do is actually pick, you know, which ones I want to track. Do I want to track the insert? Do I want to track the modifier? Do I want to track the delete? Okay. And so right now I'm just tracking these tables. Um, and if we go over here, we can actually look at the entries that it's actually generating. Uh, one of the things that I, I've already done is created some save filters. So here uh, I just went in and created a filter on the actual change log entries and said, you know, I just want to look at uh, vendor changes. So this is one of the things that you could potentially do. You could export this to Excel. Um, you could email it to somebody. Somebody could review that and then, you know, reply back in email that it's approved or not approved. And so what the change log is going to track is it's going to track the date and time that the change was made, the type of change, so whether it was an insert, delete, or modify, who changed it, um, what table was changed, what the primary field was that was changed, or it's going to list the primary field so you can see the record that was changed. So, uh, for example, I went into uh, vendor 30,000 and changed the address to cap. I changed the value and address to from it was blank before, and now I changed it to suite 100. So those are all things that the change log entry is going to show you. If uh, I look at this other one I have set up too, I have customers. Here I didn't limit it to the modifications, and you notice it kind of took a little bit longer to come back uh, to show it. So um, here, again, same thing. It's going to track date, time, type of change, uh, user ID, again, you know, which record was changed, what was the field that was changed, what was the old value, the new value. Um, so again, you know, Things that, that you want to cha track changes to, this is uh, one way you can do that. Okay. So we're going to jump back over here. Just real quickly, uh, we'll talk about one last uh, thing here, and then uh, we'll have some time, it looks like, for questions. Uh, but one of the other things out of the box that, that NAV provides is a workflow. So, you know, the document approvals for sales or purchase orders, those are ones that you may want to look at uh, using as well. So, again, it kind of comes down to that segregation of duties and the combination of system controls and process where, for example, if somebody is able to create a vendor and create a purchase order, you could have, you could put in a purchase order approval in place that, you know, if it's over $5,000 or $2,500, it's going to have to go through the predefined, um, you know, hierarchy of approval managers and let somebody look at that and review it before it's submitted. So it would give you that control that could possibly catch something bad happening. And then it's also going to provide um, evidence of that as well. So it's going to have that uh, notification, it's going to have that approval documented in the system um, so that you could be able to provide that to the auditors as well. And then just a couple of screens on the approval user setup. Uh, so um, you can see where you can set up the uh, approver for each person, um, the amount. So again, if it's over $5,000, it has to be approved, uh, things like that. And uh, so if we, we have any questions, looks like we have a little time for questions. Great. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box, um, and Kim will get to them. Um, Kim, I'm actually going to uh, take presenter control for one second. Okay. We'll just give people a couple of minutes to kind of collect their thoughts. OK. 
Okay. Um, one thing I, I just want to call attention to is if you don't feel like asking a question right now, I actually just um, uploaded a form which you, which you should see actually on the Media Viewer tab. Um, if you want to just chat with Kim offline, you can just uh, fill out your name and email um, and uh, select the day when you'd like to chat with Kim and um, she'll get back to you. Just give people another minute or so to see if any questions uh, come in. It looks like we have a somewhat shy audience today. So, um, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So I guess why don't we end there? Um, I just want to let uh, everybody know that we uh, recorded the session, and we'll send you a link uh, once it's been posted online, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, once again, there's Kim's contact information uh, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question or if you want to follow up after. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for attending. And Kim, I want to thank you as well for a, a great presentation. All right. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.